There are several places, places in the Bible where we're admonished to remember something. How come? Because we're all prone to forget, right? I forgot a name this morning. We were talking about somebody. Couldn't remember their last name. So when God says remember, it must be something important. We all know about the fourth commandment, don't we? Let's turn to it. Let's just feast our eyes on the fourth commandment. Exodus chapter 20. Verses 8 to 11. Many of you can probably quote this from by heart. Exodus 20, verse 8. Here's what it says. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work. Thou nor thy son nor thy daughter nor thy maid servant nor thy maid servant nor thy cattle nor the stranger that is within thy gates. For whenever you see a four, you should ask yourself, what is it there for? Right? For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea. And all that in them is and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Remember the Sabbath day. You know, this is our message for the world. I'd like to couple that with a couple other verses. Romans chapter 1, 20 to 25. Romans chapter 1, 20 to 25. You all know what that says already, I'm sure. But it has to do with the creator and the creation. Here's what it says. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things which are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, and so that they are without excuse. Because that when they knew, that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. They changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like, a, like to corruptible man and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. Wherefore, the Lord gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts, to dishonor their own bodies between themselves. And they changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. Creation is important. Remember the creation, creation, remember the creator. Now there's another one that's very close to that one and it's found in Revelation 14, six and seven. We all know this one. This is our message for the world. There's a world out there that's still waiting to hear this. Revelation 14, six and seven. And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to them that dwell on the earth, and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come. That little four means something here. For the hour of his judgment has come, and worship him who made, and I'd like to have you notice these next three or four words. Worship him who made heaven and earth and sea, and the fountains of water. That's a direct quote from the fourth commandment. That's our message to the world, to remember the creator, remember the Sabbath day. Our message is, is, is to proclaim the Sabbath more fully, which is a symbol. Sabbath is really a symbol, a sign of the righteousness that comes by faith. You can read that in Ezekiel 20, 12 and 20. But the apostles preached the Sabbath. Remember that little phrase, heaven and earth and sea? Let's look at a couple of texts in the book of Acts, where the preaching was really going on in the first century. Acts chapter 4, verse 24. Acts chapter 4, verse 24. It says, and when they heard that, they lifted up their voice to God with one accord and said, Lord, thou art God which hast made heaven and earth and sea and all that in them is. That's a direct quote from them. They were proclaiming the Sabbath in the first century. My Bible says that was in AD 32. 
Let's look at another one. Acts 14, verse 15. And I've been looking for these, and I found a number of them scattered throughout the New Testament, something or something very similar. Verse 15, Acts 14, verse 15. And saying, Sirs, why do you do these things? We also are men of passions like passions with you, and preach unto you that ye should turn from these vanities unto the living God, which made heaven and earth and sea and all things that are therein. Direct quote from the fourth commandment. If you want to know, somebody asks you, where does it say anything about the Sabbath in the, in the New Testament? Well, there it is. They proclaimed it to the Gentiles. Sabbath in the New Testament, a memorial of the creation. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth. Secondly, something to remember, I'd like to have us turn to 1 Corinthians 11. Another thing to remember, 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And verses 23 to 26. If you have it, say amen. For I have received of you the, of the, I have received of the Lord that which I also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. This do in what? Remembrance of me. We do this because we are admonished to what? Remember him, the great passion that he has for all of us that took him to the cross. After the same manner also he took the cup, and when he had supped, saying, this cup is the New Testament of my blood, this do ye as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. There it is again. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death until he come. Wow, that's powerful. To me, that's very powerful. <clears throat> the communion service is really a little baptism because it has with it the foot washing. Do you know that the people of the first century, the first century Christians were known as the people who washed one another's feet? Can you picture, take in, in the whole picture, Jesus uh, seated there with the disciples on that Thursday night and uh, they have been hiking probably 20 miles or so that day. Feet were all sore, tired, and uh, there was a lot of tension in the room that night because the disciples had kind of been quarreling. Jesus takes a, a basin and a towel and begins to kneel down and wash their feet. And in the 13th chapter of John, Jesus said, I've done this to you, now you do this to each other. It's really a command in, in John 13. That's why we have the foot washing. Some people have asked me, why do we do the foot washing? Because Jesus said to do it. And you know, we had called this the ordinance of what? Humility. Humility. It's an ordinance. Like baptism is an ordinance. And this, is, this can be very meaningful to each of us as we think about these things and think about the bread and the wine, the broken body and the spilt blood. That, uh, you know, this is... Uh, a little baptism, a renewal of our baptismal vows. Okay. It's a pow powerful reminder of the passion of Christ for us. A reminder of the character of God. Jesus said to do it, that's part of his mind, right? Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. For this reason, we should all wanna, want to, uh, to partake in the communion service. I know sometimes when we have a communion service, some feel that maybe they're not worthy. Make yourself ready for that. Prepare. We're going to have a, we're going to have a communion service here pretty soon, one of these days soon. Then there's baptism. Another reminder. And I would like to have you turn with me to Romans, the sixth chapter, verses two to six. Romans six, two to six. This is what baptism means. When we do a baptism, we're doing a, a pantomime, as it were, of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. And this brings it tremendously personal to us because we are accorded the high privilege of dying with him, being buried with him, as it were, symbolically, and rising with him in a new life. Uh, that's what baptism is symbolic of. Let's read it. Chapter 6 of Romans, verse 2. 
God forbid, how shall we that are dead to sin live any, more there, any longer therein? Know ye not that as many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore, and when you see a therefore, you should ask yourself, what is it there for? Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death. That like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing that this old man, what is the old man? The old man of sin. It's what we carry around all the time, every day, right? And uh, Mariah and Richard and Paul, you're still going to know that there's a conflict goes on within you. The flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. Often in the New Testament, Paul uses the word flesh to refer to the sinful nature, the carnal nature. Did you know that, that, was, that your carnal nature was crucified with Jesus on the cross? It's already an accomplished fact. All we have to do is claim that promise. Notice what it says. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified. What's the present? What's the tense here? Present tense is. Is crucified with him that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. Uh, I also like verse uh, 14. For sin shall not have dominion over you. For ye are not under the law, but under grace. Not under condemnation anymore. There's therefore now no condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus. But we have to make the choice, don't we? Every day. Every day is a choice that we make. Give your heart to Jesus in the morning. Make that your very first work. So baptism, another reminder. For this reason, we should all want to see a baptism. It's about the new covenant God has made with us. None of us will ever be saved apart from the covenant. We want to be within a covenant relationship with Jesus. And uh, so what is the benefit of the new covenant? Our Sabbath school teacher this morning talked about Romans. I just love Romans. I mean uh, Hebrews. Hebrews is a letter to the Hebrew Christians. It's after Timothy, Titus. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 15 to 17. Here's the benefit of the new covenant. It says, <clears throat> starting with verse 15, Hebrews 10. Wherefore the Holy Ghost also is a witness to us. For after that he had said before, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts and their minds will I write them and their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. When you're in covenant relationship with Jesus, this is the case. He writes his law in your hearts. The Ten Commandments are God's ideas, right? But when they're written in our hearts, they become whose idea? Our idea. We begin to want to run the way of God's commandment. Like David, after his great sin and his great forgiveness, greater forgiveness, we should say, he said, rivers of waters run down my cheeks before they have made void thy law. This is the relation, the covenant relationship that God wants each of us to have. The creator of heaven and earth visited this planet 30, for, for 33 years. He came here on a long and dangerous journey. Not only was it a long and dangerous journey, but there was a risk involved. At least twice in Desire of Ages, I've read about that risk. There was a risk involved. If there was no risk involved, why it wouldn't, it wouldn't be near as meaningful, but God risked everything. He literally poured out heaven in one gift. And what would be the result? Jesus must have wondered sometimes, I wonder if they're really getting this. One day, he was in a little, in, a, in somebody's house, in a little house, and he saw Mary do a very unselfish act. And I think maybe one of the first times he might have thought, wow, if Mary can get it, then I know other people can get it. And uh, when we read, read Revelation 7, verse 9, a lot of people are going to get it. A multitude which no man could number standing on the sea of glass. And it's for us. It's 
all for us. So uh, I want to just uh, look at a couple more texts here. Uh, Luke, Luke chapter 1. This is uh, Zacharias' uh, contribution. You know, remember Zacharias and Elizabeth? Luke chapter 1. He tells us here that we are saved from something to something. Luke chapter 1, verses 69 to 75. Luke 1, 69 to 75. He said, and hath raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of, da of his servant David. As he spoke by the mouth of his prophets, which have been since the world began. That we should be saved, what does it say next? From our enemies and from the hand of all that hate us to perform mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant. The oath which he swore to our father Abraham that he would grant us that we be delivering out of the hand of our enemies might serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all the days of our life. We are saved from something to something. Saved from our sins to a life of victory, a victorious life in Christ. As the Holy Spirit begins to carve away from our characters those things that are unlike Jesus. The result is that we become more and more like Jesus every day. So we'll be ready when he comes. We all want to be ready when he comes. How many want to be ready when Jesus comes? Yeah. So... Uh, this is a faith journey. Our Sabbath school teacher talked about faith this morning. Somebody had faith. According to your faith, be it unto you. Christianity is the only faith religion in the whole world. All of them have a ladder system where you climb to the top and somehow reach something. But uh, it's not about giving up this thing and that thing of any value. We don't ever give up anything of value. One day the disciples said to Jesus, We've given up everything to follow after you. Remember that little incident? It, the inference was, what do, were you going to get out of it? Okay? And what did Jesus say? He told them that life now, in the now, would be a hundred times better than it would otherwise. And after that, eternal life. Can you believe that? Life is a hundred times better for the believer in Jesus than if he had not accepted him. Look at the world around you and see the sorrow and the heartache that's going on around. A hundred times might be a thousand times even better. <laughs> and after that, eternal life. You can't put a price on that. Eternal life. So I want to move on here to uh, come to a close here. It's all about choices, isn't it? Choices we make. The Bible says that he that endureth to the end will be saved. So how do we maintain a connection with Jesus? You have a fresh new connection with Jesus this morning. You've seen a baptism. Have you thought about the possibility maybe that we should all recommit ourselves to Jesus as we've observed this this morning? So how do we maintain that connection? Number one, and I want to Put an emphasis on this one. Develop a prayer life. Pray without ceasing, the apostle says. Make time for developing a friendship with Jesus. That's all important. John 15, 15, Jesus is telling the disciples, I'm going to make, you're my friends now. So we develop that, that by developing a communication with Jesus, a meaningful prayer life. Secondly, daily study of God's word. Could we find time every day to spend a little bit of time learning to know Jesus? That's how we learn to know him. You can't love anybody you don't know, nor can you trust anybody you don't know. So then faith comes by hearing, and hearing by what? The word of God. God's word is powerful. Hebrews 4.12 says it's more powerful than a two-edged sword. And as we, understand, as, we, as we meditate on these precious words that we study from the Bible, faith is developed in the heart. And faith brings a strong love for Jesus. In a Christian home, 
you can set up a family altar. And as children are born into the family, that family altar will, be, will, will, will bring a lifelong memory to the little ones that grow up in that home. A family altar. Third one I have down here is uh, found in Hebrews chapter 10. You had it in your scripture reading this morning, but I would like to reread part of the scripture reading. This passage is found in Hebrews 10, 22 to 25. Hebrews 10, 22 to 25. I want to underscore this with some tremendous importance. Verse 22, let us draw near with a true heart. What kind of a heart? A true heart. We should pray for a true heart. If we don't think we have a true heart, we should pray for one, right? We should pray for a desire to know him better, for a true heart. Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. You know, one translation says, to stir us up, okay? Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. Now, <clears throat> I'm placing a lot of importance on this. The counsel here is not to forsake the assembly of ourselves together. Make Sabbath school a divine appointment. I can't emphasize that too much. The Sabbath school is the church at what? At study. It provokes us and stirs us up to want to study, study this. I heard the Sabbath school teacher say, did you study the Sabbath school lesson this week? He said, I'm not going to embarrass you. You know, in days gone by, they embarrassed us. <laughs> How many studied the Sabbath school lesson this week? <laughs> That's what they used to say to us. And, uh, you know, <laughs> I don't want to go back to those days. But when we come to Sabbath school, we're stirred up to want to study the Sabbath school the following week, right? And it's a systematic way of Bible study for us all. Um, the assembling of ourselves, that fellowship in the church, Corporate worship setting is not only good for us as we come here and worship, but it's good for those who see us come. It's an example to everybody. Remember when Jesus was baptized, he said, I'm doing this to fulfill all righteousness? Leave you an example. And so when we come to Sabbath school and church, we're leaving an example to all those around us. They're not going to be so prone to not come next time because there's great value in corporate worship. Tremendous value. I would like to read part of the value. It's Malachi chapter 3, and I'm almost finished here. Malachi chapter 3. Malachi chapter 3 is one of those special passages in the Bible. It starts out with a, with a scene of the judgment of the living. How many of you heard of the judgment of the living? Okay. We all know that the judgment began for the dead in 1844, right? But there comes a time. Soon, none know how soon, the, the judgment will pass to the living generation. And chapter 3, verses 1 to 3, is a description of the judgment of the living. Ellen G. White uses it in that sense. Judgment of the living. That's probably the next greatest event that we have ahead of us. And it, there are some things that signal it. Sometime in prayer meeting, we're going to talk about some of those things that signal the judgment of the living. And our preparation for that is to realize that Jesus is our high priest. And he longs for us to cooperate with him in his work as he wants to close up this thing. This thing we call sin. There's nobody in the whole universe that wants to see the work finished than Jesus. And uh, who do you think he's waiting for? So the first verses of Malachi 3 talk about that. But I want to drop down to the end of the chapter. 
we're talking here, the subject here is us not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together. In other words, we want to come here every week, right? So that we can so that we can benefit from what God has in store for us, but also to be an example to others. And here's what it says, verse 16. Then they that feared the Lord spake often one to another. And the Lord hearkened and heard it, and a book of remembrance was written before them that for them that feared the Lord and that thought upon his name, and they shall be mine, saith the Lord of hosts in that day when I make up my jewels. When does he make up his jewels? That's made up in the judgment of the living. For the living generation, that's when it is. When I make up my jewels, and I will spare them as a man spareth his own son that serveth him. So, there is a powerful reason for not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. Worship, corporate worship, will be accomplished throughout eternity. In the new earth, from one Sabbath to another, from one new moon to another, they'll come and worship before me, saith the Lord. So Richard and Mariah and uh, Paul, you're joining a family today. This is your family. A family of people who love Jesus. And the spirit of prophecy says the church on earth and the church in heaven are how many? One. They're one. And who can calculate the blessing that comes from that? May you all be blessed today as we consider the atoning sacrifice of Jesus. It will stabilize our lives and cause us to share blessed truth with others. You know, you can't keep this to yourself. These things that we learn from the Bible are to be shared with everybody around us. There may be somebody here today who has not made a meaningful, meaningful decision for Jesus. Given your heart to Jesus. Maybe somebody here like that. Uh, God knows who you are. And I'm not going to embarrass anybody this morning. I'm not going to do that. I don't like that approach. But if there's even a little desire, don't turn off the Holy Spirit, okay? Listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit. Pray that he will increase that desire and he'll give you the desires of your heart. If there's anybody like that, would like to be on a, on a track, on a pathway to baptism, like you saw this morning, please let one of the elders know. We want to, uh, we want to make sure that everyone who will is allowed to come. So, learning to lean. That was the title of our lesson today. Let us learn to lean on the everlasting arms. And I pray that it'll be that way for everyone here this morning. May the Lord of love and peace be with you all today. Shall we pray? Dear Father in heaven, we want to thank you again for the great and precious promises in the Bible that we can come and lean on the everlasting arms. Help us to learn how to lean. Help us to spend some time every day. Lord, put in our hearts a deep desire to want to know you better until you come. So I pray that you'll be with each one here today. I know there are lots of different needs, but that you'll be with each one specific to their need. And as we see all of the signs uh, developing around us, we know that you're coming soon to take your children home. I pray, Lord, that you will help each one of us to resolve to be among that number who gather around the throne when we live in heaven forever. May this be our prayer today in Jesus' name, amen.